Hello, Namaskara, good evening, and welcome to this conversation. I don't know how many of you have read this book already. Can, you, can we have a show of hands? OK. Uh, I hadn't until I was asked to moderate this conversation. And uh, I haven't even heard much about it, which is a great shame and a great pity, because this is a fantastic book. OK, I've really enjoyed reading it. Congratulations, Nitin. You've done a great job of translation with this. And I had no idea that there was a 2,000-year-old text called the Neetopadesha. So this came as a big surprise. And uh, I have really uh, enjoyed reading it. But of course, when I first came upon it, when Ravi said, would you like to be in conversation? Are you free on the 30th of June? I said, yes, I am. And I would love to be in conversation with Nitin. And then he, he sent me this book, or he told me about it. I didn't, for once in my life, I didn't Google to see what it was. I waited for the book to come to me. And I assumed that this was a pun. It was Nitin Zupadesha. OK, I think most of us did that, right? So I thought it was Nitin Zupadesha. And because he's into public policy, it's something about governance and public policy. And will probably be, a, yes. <laughs> I don't know what to say. That. But yeah, I really thought it would be one of those. And I was wondering why I should be involved in it. But I thought maybe Geetopadesha, Neetopadesha, I don't know. So I was involved. And true to form, when I was true to my fears, when I started, when I first opened it, again, without looking at the contents, nothing, I just started reading. And I just want to read the first paragraph of the foreword to you. You open this book, and the first thing you come across is the foreword, and this is by Professor Vivek Debroy, and he says, I have not had the good fortune to meet Professor Asfan Diyar, but I've had the good fortune to see the manuscript of the Neetopadesha. As the translator says, it's most definitely in Tokarian, though it does not seem to be in either Tokarian A or B, the two commonly known forms. It seems to be in some kind of proto tokarian The machine translation has probably got some declensions and diphthongs wrong, but the sense refined further by the translator is undoubtedly right. This is the best we can do until ownership rights to the document are sorted out. Prima facie, it seems to date to the second century of the common era when Toromana's destruction of Takshashila had not taken place. By this time, my head is completely spinning. I'm saying, what the heck is Tokarian? I'm sorry, I'm sure many enlightened people in this room will have, will have much familiarity with Tokarian. I didn't even know what it was. I didn't know that it was an old ancient language, nothing. So I'm saying, oh my god, this is really going to be a trudge. But because I admire Professor Debray so much, and because I had to read it for this interview, I read through the foreword. And then came to the next part, which was Nitin's own introduction, the translator's note about this. And it starts with how the manuscript of the Nita Pradesha came into my hands is a story in itself. And we know Nitin from reading his columns, he has a light hand with words, he's easy to read. So it, was, it went easily. And by the end of it, my mind was blown. The story of how he came upon this ancient manuscript of the Neetha Upadesha is something else. And I'd like him to give us a blow by blow account. Please tell us all the details how you came upon it, how it came into your possession. No comment. <laughs> Why? Please tell us. OK, first of all, uh, I want everyone to read what's on the very first page before the book starts. It says, uh, this is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places, and incidents are either the product of the author's imagination or used fictitiously. And any resemblance to any per actual person living or dead, events or locales, is entirely coincidental. So this is a book of fiction, right? And the question is, uh, where does the fiction start? Uh, so in the the story of how I got it, I, mean, I don't want to spoil the suspense here, is that I was hanging around in a library uh, after I'd quit my job in the Singapore government to start Takshashila. I was hanging around in the library uh, area of uh, the National University of Singapore. And uh, uh, there was a conference on Afghanistan. And after we came out from the conference, there's this man, uh, you know, Afghan dressed, a cold cap. Uh, he talks to me. Uh, asked me whether I speak Hindi. I said yes. Uh, he asked me some questions. His eyes light up, and he gives me this hug. So the story starts there. And after that, uh, I get hold of the manuscript. And uh, long story short, a computer is used 
to no, produce. No, no, no. Tell us how you came by the manuscript. This is not enough. You have to tell us everything. I think let's leave it there. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, I want to tell the story. Okay, you can do it. <laughs> so this person came up to him, asked him if he knew Hindi. He said, yes, I speak it. And then he wanted to know the location of some library within the campus, which because Nathan had spent so many years there, he knew very well. And he said that I'm, I'm taking a cab in that direction anyway, so why don't you come along with me and I'll drop you there. And in the car, this gentleman, Professor Asfandiar, uh, asked him what he did. And he said, I'm going back to Bangalore. I'm going back to India, going to Bangalore to set up a foundation or an institution called, a, called the Takshashila Institution. And this man got very excited at the mention of Takshashila. And then he, for the conversation, and then he asked him what his name was. And he said, my name is Nitin. And he got even more excited. And when he left the car, uh, you know, he sort of gave him a big hug and said, so I will see you sometime in the future, Nitina of Takshashila. And he left. And then just before Nitin and his family were leaving for India, moving back, he gets a package in the mail, a brown paper wrapped package. And when he opens it, he finds inside several sheets of an ancient looking paper, each enclosed in its own uh, individual plastic folder. And he's like, what is this? But it comes from Professor Asfandiya that he knows because he says, you know, just keep it and do visit me when you come to Afghanistan. He takes some pictures of it, moves to Bangalore, sets up Takshashila, and completely forgets about the manuscript for many years. OK, and then when, when COVID hits, Nitina of Takshashila wakes up and says, oh, I wonder what, those, what that manuscript was. And he runs the photos that he has taken on his phone on Google image search and finds out because he couldn't identify the script. And then Google tells him it's Tokarian. And not only that, tells him that it can be translated. He has to just run it to the computer, and the computer will translate it. Because lots of the, many of the pages have been destroyed a little bit, but whatever's there is, whatever has remained is very clear. And once, and the opening page tells him that, in the translation tells him that it's an old, old text from Takshashila University, I mean, around the time that Takshashila University was in its prime, and it's 2,000 years old, and it's a book of fables. And then he begins to translate it. So that's how it happened. And why is it so amazing? Because the person who is narrating those fables is a slight lunatic, eccentric person of Takshashila who was called Nitina. So a Nitina of the ancient Takshashila, that's why the, the professor got so excited and sent the book to him, sent the manuscript to him. And then he translated it. Of course, he had to use a lot of his own imagination to translate because a lot of the manuscript was missing or damaged. And then he put it out, but he didn't know what to do with the manuscript once it was once the translation was done. He couldn't. He hunted and hunted, looked and looked. In this age, when anybody is findable, he could not find this Professor Asfandiar, and he didn't know, as he says in his foreword, who the manuscript belonged to because Takshashila has been under so many empires for the last 2,000 years. And in today's political division, which country would claim it, he didn't know. And he felt he should give it back to Professor Asfandiar. So that's how the story starts. Don't you think that was a story to be told? And he's, he's refusing to tell it. So anyway, <laughs> so, uh, did you, were you interested in languages before this? Have you always had an interest in languages? Do you speak Sanskrit? Is mythology one of your favorite things? Yeah. So. Languages, yes. Uh, um, I grew up uh, across India. My father, my late father was uh, working for Canada Bank. Mm. So we moved across the country. And uh, we picked up languages. So I speak fluent Tamil, I speak fluent Kannada, I speak fluent Hindi. I get scolded at in Marathi. So, uh, so uh, I'm fluent in languages. But Sanskrit was something which I, I somehow, you know, it's like, didn't, didn't, just didn't happen. Although I encouraged my daughter to study Sanskrit, uh, because I felt a, 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 a sort of lacuna, because a lot of texts are written in Sanskrit. Uh, Arthashastra, for example, which we uh, use in Takshashila to teach public policy, is written in Sanskrit. We have many translations. We have the Shama Shastri translation, we have the Kangle translation. We have some uh, foreigners, uh, Patrick Oliver, who's translated it. But we all read this text through the eyes of the translator. Right. right? Of course. But now, as an electrical engineer, as a public policy wonk in the 21st century, if I want to understand it, I can't read the original. Right. Yeah. So not learning Sanskrit enough to be able to translate it was 
and I still feel that as a deficiency. The good news is there are very good translations available. Most Indian texts, um, popular Indian texts, have good translations. But most Indian texts in general are just not translated. They're yeah. just sitting in, you know, the leaves are sitting in some monastery somewhere, some temple somewhere. Nobody even knows what is there. So the corpus of manuscripts which exists, which is not translated, is immense. Right? And we don't have a tradition of critical study, yeah. so we don't translate it as much. And there aren't enough people who can translate it with much felicity into yeah, English. Yeah. I and, think. and in a way that is critical. Right? Yeah. It's, it's not, yeah. if, you, if you want to translate everything, you think, oh, everything was great, everything was yeah. right, that guy was perfect, yeah. Kautilya was his best guy, yeah. you know, all of that. That's easy. Yeah. But if you want to have a critical translation, right, yeah. you need to be a scholar, and that kind of scholarship is not as prevalent as it should. Yeah. You know, I'll just give another one. Hmm. Uh, in, in Greek, uh, most international relations starts with this book, Western international relations starts with a book called The History of the Peloponnesian War, written by a guy called Thucydides, right? Everybody studies this. Then we say, look, what's the history, what's an equivalent Indian his military history book or a strategy book? It's not the Arthasas, it's actually the Mahabharat, right? Right. But nobody has translated the Mahabharat yeah. from a military history point right. of view. For the last four years, I've been looking for somebody to say, hey, here's a Mahabharata, can you do a military history translation? Don't give me a translation which says Krishna is God, so everything happens, right? So that's not military history. Yeah. But there is a military history component right. which people have not done. Yeah. But we're going to very serious stuff now, you know. I'm lapsing into my Takshashila thing, so I think <laughs> we should yeah. go back into the more... Yeah, and since this is like, it, it is uh, about statecraft, about citizen craft, uh, but it's also rendered in the form of, a, of fables and stories with anthropomorph anthropomorphized animals and birds as the protagonists, which is in the same tradition as, say, the Panchatantra or the Hitopadesha. But, and the Arthashastra is also one on statecraft. So what differentiates the Nithopadesha from all these other texts? Yeah. See, and I think, uh, thanks for asking this, you know. I think all of us have read, uh, when we've, since the time we were kids, We've read stories from the Panchatantra, right? We've read stories from the Hitopadesh. Uh, and these are really moral fables which are told to us. In, sometimes we don't even recognize that this is the story it is because, you know, usually it comes as, here's this man who was walking with somebody or here's this crocodile and this monkey. Yeah, yeah. You know, these stories, yeah. you don't know where they come from. They all come from the uh, Panchatantra or the Hitopadesh, which is also part of a mega, uh, 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 uber family of texts called the Brihad Kata, right? So there's Rama and Mahabharata, which are well-known. The Brihad Kata is the third uh, big corpus, which is not as well-known, but it runs into 100 volumes. Right? Translation done in 1890 has 100 volumes. Really? Okay. And Panchatantra is just one volume of the 100. The Katha Sarit Sagar. Yeah, yeah, Katha Sarit Sagar okay. is part of that, right? One. Now, the Panchatantra and Hitopadesha are written for kings and princes. Right. Right? Just like the Arthashastra. Yes. None of us here are kings and princes. I mean, some of you might be, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's very dangerous to say this in the Mysore area, you know, sometimes, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> from the royal family of Mysore or something. But mostly, uh, these books are written for the instruction of princes. Mm -hmm. Now, we know from uh, political science and philosophy that the morality of princes are different from the morality of Absolutely, the yeah. Raja, right? Mm -hmm. Raja Dharma is different, mm -hmm. right? The Raja Dharma is in a moral world. You are using violence to increase the size of your kingdom. Uh, in international relations, there's no such thing as morality as we understand it. Mm. You can do whatever you like, right? You can kill, you can cheat, you can do... But these are these are values that are applicable in relationships between kings. Right. But you and I can't cheat each other or kill each other, right? Mm. So we have a Praja Dharma. There are very few books about the Praja Dharma. In fact, there isn't any. So if you're a citizen and you want to see what is my role in, in, in this com political community, you know, what is my role as a citizen? There just aren't any. Yeah. And reading the Panchatantra and Hitopadesha to get that might give you the wrong ideas. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because you'll start behaving like a prince. Yeah. You'll say, it's okay, I can be, I can cheat. You know, it's okay, I can, I can lie. You know, I yeah. can stab my partner in the back. Yeah. These are not the values you want to have as a citizen. Right. Right? So, Hitopadesha addresses that. Mm. So, it's basically a book about Prajadharma. It tells people, what is it that you do? What is the right way to behave? in a political community, in society, such that everybody benefits. Mm. It's, it, isn't it quite unusual that we don't have a book, a text, an ancient text on Prajadharma, considering that, you know, our prime minister recently said democracy is in our DNA, 
And, and it is true in a sense, because we've had sabhas and samitis forever. We have had popular representation, house of elders, even though even in monarchies, we haven't, haven't had so many republics, but in the Janapadas and the Mahajanapadas, we've had a uh, lot of people representation. So what happens in this book, uh, in the Nitopadesha, is towards the end, so the whole thing is based on the, this Nitina of Takshashila is this eccentric person who is imprisoned in the, uh, the Raja of Takshashila. Sa in Cyrus the Great's prison. In Cyrus the Great's prison. Yeah, the, the yeah, King, okay. Cyrus. So King Cyrus is prison in Takshashila. And there is this republic called Chakrapuri, which wants to train its children in the art of Praja Dharma. They're saying they're losing all their morals and they don't know how to behave as good citizens and we need to train them. But children, as we all know, will not listen to uh, like a lecture. So how do you, so in the ancient tradition of India where not only children but adults are taught things through storytelling, uh, they want to teach through stories. And they have heard of this man called Nitina of Takshashila who is imprisoned because of his weird ideas, you know, his radical different kinds of ideas. He's been imprisoned because he's dangerous to be let loose. So the monarch, monarch thinks. So the elders decide, okay, let us go and pay for him to be freed for, with so many silver bars. We will have him released. And let's give him a challenge. Let's ha we have enough money to release him for about 90 days. And we'll ask him if he can come and teach our children the art of stay as citizen craft so that we'll have a better realm in the future. And they free him and bring him and say, can you do this in 90 days? Can you teach our children how to be good citizens of this uh, Republic of Chakrapuri? And Nitina says, were well, you overpaid? I would have taught them in 30 days. You didn't have paid for me so much. And then they say, yeah, yeah, idle boast, please try. And then he sits down under a tree and begins. And unlike uh, other teachers who choose like a, you know, a, a quiet spot by a stream. Vastu compliant. Vastu compliant. <laughs> Sylvan surroundings. Nitina sits down in the middle of the marketplace, which is very much like teaching philosophy. The Gita's philosophy is taught in a battlefield. You know, that kind of thing. So he's sitting in the middle of the marketplace with all this noise and chaos around him. And he starts telling his stories. And by, by the end of 30 days, what, yeah, what, is, what they translate, what they have written as one turn of the moon, he's done. He's finished teaching them. The children are all educated. And the elders are like, elders of Chakrapuri are like, wow, this is amazing. But what has also begun to happen in those 30 days is that the children have begun questioning their elders. Because this is what learning is, and this is what inquiry is, according to Indian philosophy, always it is about the lamp of critical inquiry. Question, 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 received wisdom. And so the children become bold enough to question everything, and the parents are like, uh, I think we should get rid of this Nitina politely. You know, we can't let him stay. But he's finished, he's done what he said he would, and the condition was if you do what you say, you, you ask what you're saying, within 90 days you can educate them, we will buy your freedom entirely from the king, and you will be free. And they had thought we will keep him here, but he was proving to be so dangerous that they said, we will get you free because we keep our word, but we will also politely send you away. And they gave him a gulak, two, two gulaks, a cart, and said, why don't you go spread your knowledge in other places, but leave our children alone? So he left. And I'm wondering if the elders of the monarchies that came after the Janapadas, if they did something similar about you know, taking the mm, Prajadharma texts out so that nobody would question the monarchies anymore, and all yoga kshema would be only dependent upon the king to deliver to his prajas, but the prajas had no responsibility or didn't know what they were supposed to do. They just had to be sheep. You know, yeah, you're right. See, I think the first thing about uh, in Indian history, I think we had all forms of government, mm. right? And we also had, uh, you know, what you're called village republics, mm. where power was not in the hands of one chief, or even if it was a chief, it was, you know, distributed among a lot of the elders. And there was represent in a way, accountable government. Mm. I don't think it was democracy in the sense that everybody was considered equal and everybody had a vote on, you know, in how or things are. They had voice, mm. right? But they didn't have vote. And even when you look at those republics, they couldn't just do what they wanted. There was some kind of a rule of law, mm. right? They had to be compliant to the rule of law. So I think we could accurately say that there were republics in Indian history, but I don't think you can accurately say we had democracy. Right. right? Okay. Democracy is a very new concept where everybody is considered equal, everybody gets a right to vote. Uh, but even when there were kings, the kings couldn't do, you know, exactly what, what they, wanted. they wanted. At least normatively, there was Raj Dharma, there were, there were, um, there were texts 
they had to get the the they had to comply with the the brahmins who were the you know custodians of dharma and so on so there were some kind of checks and balances it was not absolute monarchy at least normatively as we understand it right now as to the question of why is there no text of praja dharma in fact there is no text of praja dharma in any society oh okay most in fact many of the countries it's even worse it says that you know the king has got this divine right to rule yeah, thou shalt obey this guy yeah that's true you can only obey the guy right yeah. so the only you know, you have a one line text you yeah. know obey <laughs> obey the leader right because he's yeah. he's he usually it's a he yeah. and it's he's he's you know is appointed by heaven and you jolly well do what he says mm-hmm. right i i think we had a little more of a tradition of inquiry of accountability uh within of course the varnashrama dharma right course. so they were not everybody was not equal no. you you know if you were a high status brahmin you could get away with a lot of things but if your status is not high enough life was not as easy as it would have been right but we did have a tradition but i don't think it is in the interests of anybody who had in power to let such texts proliferate right why would you want to tell people that you have the right to question, question. the king yeah. right why would you tell people that you have the right to question the the religious leadership right so you wouldn't so you would try as much as possible to suppress these kind of texts yeah. and you know keep people you know in 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 a way blind to their own rights right. uh, and and the, the power that they wield yeah that's why this is so significant actually that you managed to find an old text that actually said this it makes us feel very happy about that in india perhaps there were texts like this and so much of it is in consonance with modern life some of it is so and you wonder wow they already they they did think like that and somehow along the way we've lost it but um, there are four books right in the neeto padesha the first is called the jewel of citizen craft which is about praja dharma the duties and obligations of the citizens the second one is the thread of the science of prosperity which is about markets and things economics and then there is a third which is uh, the subtle scales of judgment which is about sadachara or good behavior and morals and then there is the last one which is uh, what was the arrow of the arrow of policy so it's about ethics in public policy so these are the four now dr debroy in his uh, introduction in his full word he says usually this fable based texts have five strands like the panchatantra so they have five books and he says probably professor asfandiar didn't have it or didn't send you there must have been another book which is missing so if you had to guess hazard what that fifth book might have been about we'll never know if there was a fifth book or not probably never know but if there was a fifth book what might what topic might it deal with actually professor debroy alleges to be i think you've been both diplomatic <laughs> Professor Debra alleges that there was a fifth book, <laughs> but either Nitin Pai or the publishers have censored it, right? <laughs> because it might not be palatable to uh, modern audiences. His allegation is like this: is you know, uh, first one is about uh, uh, citizenship, then about Artha, Artha, Dharma, Artha, Moksha. Yeah. So he says the fifth one should probably be about Kama. <laughs> so this should have been about love romance sex and either mitin or the artificial intelligence was so prudish yeah <laughs> he says he says the artificial intelligence must have been so prudish, so prudish <laughs> that they left it out my response to him was i mean it's not in the book but yeah. my response to him was if it was there i would have put it <laughs> well i'm not prudish yeah. and i don't think the ai is prudish mm-hmm. and i don't think he's he's right because uh we have four vedas we don't have five right right so in fact there's supposed to be only three there is supposed to be three and the yeah. fourth one is added yeah. and there are i don't know how lots of uh, upanishads yeah. and lot of puranas yeah. and all that so there's nothing about yeah. yeah i think vivek was being uh, tongue in cheek yeah uh, he just wanted to uh, sort of rib me and uh, yeah. sort of make this very interesting allegation <laughs> uh, but i don't think there there, there is uh, and you know i would have thought like if you said what should be the fifth book let's yeah, say it was yeah. about karma yeah. right? let's say it's about love romance sex mm. uh well to some extent it would have made maybe the story uh, stories a little more interesting uh 
And but it's also, also, also significant and important, I think. Also. Yeah. I would have liked to hear what Nithina said about Yeah, but you know, I don't like the idea of putting in romance just because there's no romantic uh, interest, you <laughs> there's know. No, there's but no but having said that, there is, there is romance, you know. In fact, this book is like what those of us who grew up in the 80s uh, would have seen uh, in uh, video cassette trailers, you know. This is <laughs> the action-packed, romantic, musical, thriller, <laughs> detective story, mystery of the year. It has everything. <laughs> it does have romance. Yeah. Though, in fact, it starts with romance. Yeah, two that crows, is sweet. Yeah, two that crows, is so Rajni Rata and Chandramani. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it's a romantic story. So yeah. there is this very thoughtful, beautiful crow called Chandramani. Yeah. And Rajni Rata, the other crow, wants to marry her. Mm -hmm. So he goes to her and says, will you marry me? So she says, yes, but you have to bring me a jewel. You know, I have to... I have to look after my own interests. There are a lot of suitors, so you have to be a bring me a jewel. She was not only beautiful, but also intelligent. Intelligent. Yes. And uh, she says, you have to bring me a jewel. And he says, I don't have a jewel. But she says, okay, you can take 30 days or 100 days or something yeah. and bring it. But if you don't bring it in that many days, you'll have to chop off your wings. So this is more than what uh, Rajni had uh, bargained for. So he goes, travels up and down, um, learns a lot of things, and then comes back. And they sit on the branch of a tree, and then he tells her the mm. stories that he says, "I didn't get a jewel, mm. but I learned these things." And then he tells her those stories. So there are. That's the first book. Yeah, yeah. And um, so this this that beautiful kind of Indian storytelling, wheels within wheels, cogs within cogs, and while somebody's telling the story, it's actually somebody recounting the story of someone else telling a story. It's, it's, it's beautiful and we are somehow, I think as Indians, I don't know how the younger generation feels, but anyone who grew up listening to Indian stories in the 80s and 70s and, you know, read Amas Trikatha, we are so used to that kind of storytelling. It has a particularly special place in our heart and we are able to recall it much better, retain it much better and we love that, that, that concept of deviating, constantly taking detours into everybody's backstory, you know, so that nobody actually ever knows the full story. And then you can keep adding because you forget. You can keep adding your own variations on it and that's how the story grows and grows and grows. So that must have been quite a challenge while you were translating. If so much of it was missing, you would have had to use your own imagination to fill it up. Yeah. Did reading stories in your, Indian stories in your child, are you also a fan of that kind of story? Yeah, yeah I know. I, I mean, just those are very, very, the simpler stories are the best, right? Because yeah. they give you a lot to reflect on. Mm. But you know, what you said about Indian stories is very interesting. This is called a boxed structure, right? right? So it's like, you know, I mean, those of us who did mathematics know that, you know, you have algebraic expressions as brackets and there's brackets. Yeah. So it's like that. It's a boxed structure. There is an inner story that's surrounded by an outer story. There's another story outside. So some of the stories have recursions, you know, they're self-referencing. Yeah. Uh, some of the stories are puzzles. In the puzzles. book, we are referencing, we are the, first referencing three. the first yeah. one. So there's a lot of mathematics uh, involved, right? Set theory and mathematics. You know. Very interesting. Mm. And it's the same with the Panchatantra. It's the same. In fact, uh, uh, those of you who have the energy and the time, I would really recommend reading the Katha Sarit Sagar. Yeah. Uh, Meena Arora has a wonderful book, uh, which came out, I think, five years ago uh, on this. So it's actually Lord of the Rings. It's actually fantasy. You know, if there's very little, uh, there's very little, uh, you know, theology or religious stuff in it. It's largely fantasy. So there are apsaras, there are vidyadharas who are sorcerers, there are courtesans, there are princes and talking animals, and there are robots. Mm -hmm. So and they're all in that structure. Mm -hmm. You know, this all like somebody tells like the Arabian Nights, right? You start telling a story, then something else happens, and you go into yeah, another story yeah. and keep going inside. Yeah. So. Uh, inception. Nothing linear about it. Nothing linear about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so then another thing Bibek de Broy says in his foreword is that at the end of the first book, the Prajadharma book, the, the fox actually puts together the maxims of good citizenship. And he says it's probably the best exposition of the duties of a good citizen that he has ever seen. So would you read them out for us? He even goes on to say that if the makers of our constitution had read this, if they had had this to read, they probably would have constructed the fundamental duties differently. The fundamental duties of a citizen, they might have added something to it. So would you read out those maxims and then tell us as a public policy wonk, uh, what, how the fundamental duties could have been different, the Indian ones, what else could have been added? Ah, okay. So that's interesting. So what's happening is this is the Rajni Rata crow. Mm. The crow comes back and then uh, he tells uh, Chandramani all the stories. So I won't uh, spoil the suspense. But he says, uh, 
Then Chandramani says, tell me, O Rajni Dutta, what is the essence of it all? So Rajni Dutta replies, a hundred days have I traveled across forests, rivers, deserts, lakes, mountains, and seas. From what I have observed, perceived, heard, inferred, deduced, and analogized. Now, these are the pramanas in Indian philosophy, right? Yeah. Observation, yes. perception, yeah. uh, what you hear, Anumana, inference, yeah. anumana, and all that. Yeah. From what I observed, heard, perceived, etc., this is what I have learned. One must first choose a realm to live where there is rule of law, where people strive for a balance between selfishness and altruism, where mutual trust paves the way for cooperation, where there is a lasting harmony from playing one's assigned roles, where thoughtful rules fairly applied strengthen society's morals, where constant vigilance and critical voices protect all citizens, where actions are judged according to their consequences, where there are conversations, where conversations are polite, civil, and mindful. For in such a realm, there surely will be happiness, well-being, and prosperity. So that's what uh, is his learning about Prajadharma. What would you have added to the fundamental duties? What are we missing? So this is what he says. And basically, he's saying you should be talking about you know, supporting the rule of law. You have a duty to hold the feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. I'll read out a story that, that yeah. brings that out. Okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. We have the time. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, each story is fantastic, and I love that whole Vikram Betal kind of ending, where the story is told and then a discussion on it. Yeah, yeah. let me just find that story. Okay, this is uh, the sto this is Radhi Ratha telling uh, Chandra Chandramani the story. Right, it's the mongoose who was wise, who was wise and just. Mm. In the middle of the great southern river, there is an island by the name of Aravala. It was ru ruled by a notorious lion, Durguna whose depredations got worse by the day. The terror he created in the minds of his subjects was the basis of his rule. This he reinforced at regular intervals through arbitrary acts of cruelty and caprice. Four jackals were his ministers, sidekicks, and principal enforcers, carrying out all kinds of atrocities in his name. First, Durguna demanded that he be carried on the back of the tallest elephant, Balagaja. Then he forced the monkeys to wash and clean him every day. All animals were to prostrate themselves whenever he passed by. Those who failed to do so would be thrown into the river and have their property confiscated. All this they endured until one day, Durguna ordered that each animal must send in one of his ox offspring as a special tax. Mother Hare decided that enough was enough, and she would not put up with Durguna's misrule anymore. In most of these stories, the women are the, yes. the, yeah. the strong characters, right? Others were inspired by her courage, and thus began the revolt. The animals marked, marched to Durguna's seat and demanded that he revoke all his oppressive demands. This he refused and threatened to order his enforcers to attack them. But when he looked around, he discovered that the four jackals were nowhere to be seen. He bared his fangs. He gave a mighty roar. He clawed the air in great fury. But the assembled animals did not move back an inch. That was when Balagaja's mother moved forward and calmly sat down in front of Durguna, thus shielding his subjects. The tyrant realized that the game was up and promised to mend his ways. His subjects, however, had enough of him and threw him into the river. After their bad experience with kings, the animals decided they would elect their leaders instead. That was how Vanaketu the Mangus began became the chief of Aravala. He promised a benevolent rule, assuring freedom, equality, and justice for all. For a few months, Everyone reveled in the heady atmosphere of the Mangus's administration. Then, one day, the four jackals quietly approached Vanaketu. Bending low in submission, they said they would be honored to serve their new master just as they had served the old. After all, administering a realm was no easy task, and their counsel, skill, and expertise would be an invaluable asset to the new chief. Besides, they could also help him win in his re-election. Re Vanaketu thought, these jackals are un untrustworthy, but I think they'll be useful to me. So he agreed to employ them. No one raised their voice because they respected Vanaketu and they knew he was wise and just. When the jackal suggested that Vanaketu would be able to perform his duties better if he could move faster from place to place. For this to happen, the animals would be required to clear the road whenever he approached. Vanaketu agreed. No one objected because they respected Vanaketu and knew that he was just and wise. Next, the jackals exhorted Anugaja to volunteer to carry Vanaketu on his back. 
for what a privilege it was for the young elephant to be the leader's mount, and what a privilege it was for the little monkeys to wipe the leader's body clean. No one objected, because they respected Vanuketu and knew that he was just and wise. A thought then occurred to Vanuketu that since he was the chosen leader, perhaps the animals could bow to him to show their respect. Not to him, but to his high office. No one objected, because they, ob they respected Vanuketu and knew that he was just and wise. Then, one day, after the review of the realm's finances, the jackals proposed a special tax on everyone. Each animal was to put at the leader's disposal just one of its offspring every year. Vanuketu agreed. No one objected, because they respected Vanuketu and knew that he was just and wise. Yeah. <laughs> so it's animal farm all over again, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, just one thing. Yeah. That's why Rajni, so after that, after each story, there's usually a discussion, yeah, right? So the discussion between Rajni Dutta, the, the crow, and Chandramani. Now, Chandramani is a very, very intelligent interlocutor. You know, she, she challenges Rajni Dutta and uh, his learnings. But I'll just summarize, I don't want to read the whole thing. Rajni Dutta says, that is why Bhimaraya, the great lawmaker, warned that hero worship is a sure road to degradation and eventual dictatorship. Leaders should never be beyond criticism. Leaders should never be immune to shame. A happy and prosperous realm is one where the citizenry is ever vigilant, ever critical, and ever vocal. Whether with kings or chieftains, empires or janapatas, great cities or humble villages, it is vigilance, criticism, and voice that protect Yogakshima, that protect freedom, justice, happiness, and prosperity. As, the, as a great grandsire of a great janapata once said, Italian, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, please. It, and, and you've talked a um, about also dharmo rakshita, rakshiti, rakshitaha. Would you like to t talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I, I really love that yeah, statement. It I is really lovely. In one of the Upanishads, yeah, I don't know which yeah, one. Yeah. Dharmo rakshati rakshitaha basically means that dharma protects those who protect it. And I've always felt that this should have been a national motto. Yes. Right? Satya Mev Jayate is, I mean, it's nice, but it says truth triumphs. But you're a, you're a republic. Yes. I mean, it's not your business to pursue truth, right? If it's, if it's a philosophical enterprise or a scientific establishment or, or an educational enterprise, you could say Satya Mev Jayate, you want to chase, you know, you want to pursue truth. But a republic should ensure the rule of law and protect its citizens. And Dharma Rakshati Rakshata is a great... Yeah. Uh, statement. What it basically says is that if you protect the system, mm. the system will protect, protect you. you. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so that's, beautiful. Yeah. And that's what so it is. Succinct also. So your, your, your job as a citizen yeah. is to, in, in the modern context, is to uphold the constitution. Right. Right. If you strengthen the constitution of India, the constitution of India will support protect you. you. Yeah. That's that's what it is. So it's yeah. a, it's a it's basically a plea to be constitutional in behavior to have a constitutional morality, yeah. to act and expect others to act according to constitution. Yeah. And even though it's such an ancient text, usually ancient text, particularly if it was originally written in Sanskrit and then translated to Tocharian, then it probably, and came from Takshashila, it's very North India. But the names of places that are used in the book, they were so, they were so delightful and I was so happy to note, it opens with in the town of Bandipura. And I was like, oh my God, that's us. <laughs> you know? And then there was also Kundapura, and there is Begur, imagine. So, and then and, you said Himalaya just now, yeah, which is And there's Kovai. Huh? There's Kovai. There's Kovai and Pumpuha. There's Kovai, there's yeah. Pumpuha. Yeah. And there is yeah. uh, the Northeast, many places in the Northeast. Oh, wow. Yeah, and there's uh, <laughs> Eastern <laughs> India. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. There are, and there are places outside India. There's Singapore and there's China. Yes, yes, China. There's Persia. I know, I know. There is, yeah. uh, there is you know, Sri Lanka. Yeah. So all the spaces which we would look at as, you know, the Indian sphere of influence. Yes, yes. They're all there and it's fantastic. And also how much of what is said in this book has been has been uh, proposed as new ideas, you know, for uh, modern ideas. That is very surprising because when they talk about markets in the second book in Artha, they talk uh, about how price is decided in the markets, how does one decide what exactly to price a product uh, that, so that it's not too high or too low. And they talk, and the, who, whichever the protagonist, he says that it's an unseen spirit moves through the markets correcting the price. And that's Adam Smith, you know, the invisible hand. And I was like, my God, this is this is really amazing that all these are old, old ideas. We know this. 
whoever, you know, those of us who, who engage with the ancient Indian texts, we know that a lot of what are called modern ideas, particularly in philosophy and, you know, mindfulness and all these new trendy things are very, very old ideas, which have already been thought through by uh, our people and people across the world also. So it's always such a, such a thrill of recognition, you know, oh, they knew this as well. So you feel very happy about it. Did, was, did that surprise you? That's in, but, but there are things, we'll talk about what things are very different. Uh, from the other ancient texts, but this one that you know, two ways to look at it, right? Mm -hmm. One is, I think the realm of ideas, most ideas have already occurred, right? right? Of course, you just rediscover them, yes. So, for example, uh, there's this whole uh, idea of okay, let's look at realism in statecraft, right? Uh, being amoral statecraft, a lot of people say, oh, Machiavelli invented uh, amoral statecraft. But Kautilya was 1,500 years ago, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Um, if you look at uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, huh. he's talking about skepticism yeah. and atheism yeah. today. Yeah. Jairasi Bhatta was 800 AD, and he, he, he said very much the same thing as Richard Dawkins. Rigveda has skepticism. Rigveda, Rigveda has skepticism. Yeah. So in that sense, I don't think yeah. the realm of ideas, there's that many new things which, I think there are people who rediscover them, Sometimes it just comes to you, right? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. people go through similar experiences. Of course. Come out, autodidacts, yeah. they come up with yeah. it. Sometimes you just rediscover. You know, the whole story of how Europe re rediscovered what the Greeks and the Romans had uh, written, you know? Very few people know this. The Greeks and the Romans up to, let's say, 400 AD yeah. had a massive amount of knowledge, right? In philosophy, in science. And then medical so, science, particularly medical science. Medical yeah, science, yeah. almost every area, yeah, right? yeah. And then around from 400 AD, people start forgetting it in Europe, right? Because there's Western vandals, Roman there are, there are, yeah, the Roman Empire collapses, yeah. there are vandals, there yeah. are all sorts of tribes, and they call those places the Dark Ages. Yes, right? so 1,000 years. 1,000 years, they yeah. forget everything. Yeah. They become like, they go back to, yeah. you know, tribes fighting tribes, right. superstition and all of that. Only the church sort of carries the lamp in some way. And then after the Crusades, when they acquire texts from the Arabs, Islamic, yeah. who had translated Greek into uh, Arabic, Arabic. They retranslate it back from Arabic <laughs> into Latin. And then they discover Plato, they discover Aristotle, they discover Socrates and all of that, yeah, right? Yeah. So in that sense, you know, this business of... And uh, the discovery. Arabs have done this very fine service of also translating Sanskrit things. So suddenly knowledge became... Yeah. Everybody uh, knew everything. That, uh, yeah. that caliph of Baghdad... Ba yeah, 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 Rashid, uh, Harun al-Rashid. Harun al-Rashid. Yeah. And they had the house of knowledge where they translated mm -hmm. knowledge from all, uh, yeah. from all domains. Right? So I think there is a tradition of... Uh, discovering, forgetting, rediscovering, yes. forgetting yes. again, and yeah. so on. Yeah. Uh, where was I? What else did I want to ask? Okay, so would you like to read out uh, would you all are the names? Did you find the names really unusual? Did you come across any other? There, there's also that really lovely story of the seven rabbits. Oh, yeah. So I was wondering, you know, if that manuscript was not very clear whether you made up these names by yourself. The, the, like, I, it reminded me of the seven dwarfs, you know, happy, grumpy, angry. Yeah. This is like. But these, uh, these, uh, these uh, rabbits are called something else. No? They're yeah. called. Buddha C and Guru. No, but that's, that's, uh, that's, that's very easy. They're days, days of the week. week. Yeah. Days yeah. of the week. Why is the Sunday one called that? The last one is called, let me tell you the names of the yeah. rabbits. Yeah. The, uh, okay, this is in the third book. Mm. So this, the structure is that, uh, uh, the two dogs, two uh, great dogs who serve the king of justice uh, have a debate. One of the dogs decides that the lord of justice, who's Yama, Yama actually, yeah. uh, has a very easy job. The guy is just sitting and doing nothing. So, you know, we do all the hard work, but he just sits there. So one of the dogs, uh, uh, Switani, I think. That's a beautiful story, uh, actually. So the, yeah. other, the, the other guy is uh, Sumraka. Sumraka. Yeah. So Sumraka says this, and Switani is the other dog. He says, no, actually, it's not true. Our, our boss has the most the difficult job. job. He's yeah. the toughest job in the world, yeah. in the universe, and he's always busy. So he says, what do you mean? So then Switani starts telling this story to Sumraka, right? And the story is about seven rabbits, okay? The seven rabbits, they, they live in a... A place called Harupesha in Kamarupa country. Kamarupa would be yeah, Assam, Assam yeah. right? And the names of the rabbits are as follows Somasa, Mangalasi, Budasa, Gurusi, Shukrasa, Shanisi, and Babukupa. So, how did this guy Babukupa come about? So, those of you who know company. And you made one 
Uh, I mean, it's one of them is uh, sounds like a male, and the other, the next yeah, one is. I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think they are both. They are actually male and female. Yeah. So Somasa is male, male Mandalasi is female, yeah. and so on. Yeah. So they are not happy, dumpy. Yeah, they are no, no. <laughs> actually not all there's gender yeah. balance. Yes. Here. Yes. Yeah. But Babu Kupa in Konkani actually means stupid. Oh. Okay. So the last rabbit is is, is stupid. Right? Yeah. So that's. But that's, did he act stupid in the? Well, we read it. We find okay. that. <laughs> but anyway, so I don't know how the Konkani name came there, though. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's what I find. It's very nicely distributed across India in terms yeah, of I languages. Just to be concrete, but yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I read one of the stories is the rabbits tell each other. So what happens there is the rabbits confront this snake called Mahasarupa, right? This is this giant snake. So the rabbits are very naughty. They go into a cave where they're not supposed to go, and they get caught because they're trapped by a uh, by a great snake. And they tell like uh, you know, it's almost like Andaz apne apne. They tell crime master go go. You know, up here, here, here. So then Mahasarupa, the snake says, "Okay, I listen to you guys, uh, but I let you go if you answer these riddles. All of you can ask me a riddle. If I if I get it wrong, you can go. But if I get it right, then catch. Yeah. So 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 they ask them riddles. So this is one of the riddles. Budhasa narrates this story. So you know, the other rabbits have gotten away. So it's Budhasa's turn. So you know, he, he asks the riddles. The, the the snake gets the riddles wrong. So this is the Story of the three offenders. Once upon a time, in a town called Mokohima, there lived a notorious fox by the name of Forang. He was unemployed because he was lazy and would skive off work at a moment's notice. He always had a dishevelled look because he was untidy and never would voluntarily clean himself. He was unreliable and no one depended on him to do anything properly. Above all, he was a drunkard, spending most of his nights at tavern at the tavern. Consuming large amounts of mead and frequently making a nuisance of himself. One night, Forang drank even more than he usually did, and when he demanded another pitcher of the mead, the tavern keeper threw him out of the door. It was close to midnight, and in outrage, Forang started singing loud, drunken songs, insulting the tavern keeper as he tried to find his way back home through the dark streets of the town. This caused many residents to swear and curse him for disturbing their sleep. After some more tuneless singing and aimless wandering, Forang fell into a gully, gully and fell fast asleep, snoring loudly. It so happened that Mangsho the pig was passing by at this time. He saw a pouch of coins lying beside the gully and picked it up. It was tied with a string with colorful beads used to identify its owner. From the sound of the snores nearby, he knew that the coins must belong to whoever it was sleeping there. He looked around. And confirming that he was unobserved, quietly made off with the pouch. When Forang woke up the next morning, he found his pouch of coins missing. He looked in and around the gully, but there was no sign of the pouch. He walked back to the tavern and back again through the path he thought he had taken, but there was no, there was no sign of the pouch. He looked in many, pla many more places before he realized that it was not lost but stolen. So he went to the constable, Kasopa the Turtle. To complain about his loss, Kasopa said, "Forang, you good for nothing. What have you come here for?" When Forang said he had come to complain about the lost, uh, stolen pouch of coins, this is what the constable said: "You are notorious in this town, and I know all about your habits. You were drunk last night as usual and troubled the good citizens by your disorderly behaviour. Now, if you say your money was stolen, then that serves you right. So go away, for I shall not entertain complaints." By bad characters like you, thus the unhappy Forang made his way back, uh, made his way back home. At this point, so this this is the story ends. At this point, in the rank and baleful cave, the third rabbit and asked the third rabbit stopped and asked the snake, "O Mahasarupa, the wisest of serpents, the greatest of your kind, solve for me this riddle. Who among the three, Forang, Mangsho, and Kasopa?" Is the worst of all. I think we should take a show sure. of hands. Who do you think is the worst of all? You say the first. Forang the drunkard. The drunkard, Mangsho the pig who stole the coins, or Kaso Kasopa the turtle. The police. The police. Uh, the the constable who who scolded Forang and asked him to go away. Who Who's think, the worst? Who thinks Forang is the worst? Who thinks Forang is the worst? <laughs> okay. Who thinks uh, Mangsho? Mangsho, the pig, the pig, stole, yeah. is the worst. And who thinks uh, Kasopa, the turtle, is the worst? 
such good good praja so we have <laughs> we have very good praja yeah. so basically he says of course the the snake says uh, um he gives various answers and he i think he says it's the pig so the the rabbit says however o strongest of serpents your answer is incorrect you neglected to compare the thief and the constable to see who might be in the greater wrong if you had you are sure to have noticed that the constable's crime was worse for he willfully refused to do his duty out of his prejudice against the fox the wrongs of those charged with protecting the law are worse than those who merely break it yeah but yeah beautiful and we were t- i was going to say which were the th- what is it about this text that's different from the other texts we have the ancient texts and i think the last uh, book the at the arrow of policy which talks about equality and which has as its chief protagonist and hero a female frog who saves the world from an evil villain i just love that that an indian text has this you know the the fem- ancient indian text the female is the hero so would you read us one of the stories of uh, what's her name i forgot surasundari 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 is a fairy you know yeah. okay i can read this so what happens in this story is that surasundari is a uh, is a frog and she has two cousins or male cousins and when they come of age in in the in that they live in a pond right they live in a pond called uh, Uh, no uh, it's called paripurna the uh, the the pond is called paripurna they lived a tribe of frogs whose grand uncle was a grand old frog named kuntaka right so kuntaka is this grand old man uh, grand, grand old frog and there are three little frogs who come of age and it's the tradition in that pond that when they come of age they go on a world tour right they go on a tour of the world so the all three of them are very excited they go to the kuntaka and say uncle now we want to go for a world tour it seems it can take the world is so large that it takes 7 days to go around the world so basically it's their pond you know that that pond it takes 7 days so they think that's the world so uh, the uncle says yeah two of you can go no problem then the girl uh, surasundari says but uncle you are mistaken there are three of us he says no you can't go girls can't go you know females can't go so uh, it's only the males so you have to stay back so she is very sad so she is like uh, sobbing and uh, she meets a black swan that's hagrid basically uh, abjadamalla right so she meets this uh, black swan called abjadamalla abjadamalla says so why are you sad uh, so he says uh, she says you know i can't go for a world tour and she says uh, oh he says oh you are it's so bad your uncles and your tribe has not heard of savitri bai and the philosophies of people like savitri bai who talked about uh, women's equality uh, it's so sad so he says the next day the uh, abjadana la says you can come with me there's a mission that i am on you can join me and he you know he basically the frog sits on the swan's back and goes uh, goes uh, goes off, to goes off yeah. right so they encounter many things but this is a story which uh, abjadana la tells her mm. okay, this is before their trip so abjadana la tells us how the cat and the hen set their house on fire near the great desert there is a small town by the name of samadhana on the outskirts of which there was a they lived a cat named daru hasta and a hen named dwidala the arrangement was such that the cat was given the attic to sleep while the hen had the hut outside one day daru hasta said to the hen it appears to me that the lofty position of my quarters must surely be due to my superior status After all cats are four legged creatures who perform many useful and important tasks we protect the house from vermin and note to bring good fortune to its inhabitants that is why we cats are assigned a place indoors it happens to me that the humble position of your abode must be because you are an inferior after all you have two legs and the wings don't carry you too far your life needs to be guarded from foxes and jackals and your habits are most unclean that is why you are meant to live outdoors dwidala therefore i say you must take orders from me therefore i say that you must seek my permission before you take any action therefore you must bow your head and speak softly when you address me just so you know my claws are sharp as scissors as are all my teeth after this the cat's attitude and behavior got worse by the day until the hen could no longer bear his oppressive conduct so she said to him 
Dario has to hear this. Hence, perform more important functions for the household. Hence, rid the house of worms and harmful insects. Hence, provide food and sustenance to the house. Cats do not. Hence, earn money for the household by giving their very lives. Cats do not. Hence, guard the house from four-legged predators by sounding early warning, often at the cost of their own lives. Cats know only how to flee. It is clear that between cat and hen, it is the hen that is more important. That is why it is the hen that should have the highest status. Clearly, it is I who deserve the lofty place that you wrongly occupy. The cat refused to vacate his spot. And the hen began to treat the cat the way he used to treat her. They constantly quarreled on the living quarters. They constantly quarreled over sharing meals. They constantly quarreled over domestic duties and over the many repairs of the household. Every day was spent in argument as to who was superior and why. One night, Dari Hasta decided to finish the matter by burning the hen's hut. So much the better if she was inside when, when he burns it. He took a flaming torch and burnt the hen to the ground. When he went inside the house, he was surprised to see Drugala come down the stairs with a flaming torch in her hand. The smoke from the roof told him that his loft was up in flames. They both rushed out of the house to save themselves from death. Each ordered the other to fetch water from the well and put out the fire. They could not agree on who, could take, who should take orders, nor on where to douse the fire first. Thus, their house burned down and became a heap of ashes. Then. In the quiet of the night, they heard the bloodthirsty howls of the approaching predators. Right? Yeah. So, so the, what this story is saying is, you know, Abjad Bala says, when people create notions of superior infer and inferior, they sow the seeds of division, discrimination, and oppression. Once created, such notions are perpetuated beyond time or sense or justice. For who wishes to surrender advantages they get by birth? Once created, such notions destroy the soul of society and create cycles of oppressions that are endless until they are stopped. Nay, we should neither accept nor make any claims of superiority. For if the cat and the hen had accepted the principle of equality, their lives would have been longer, if not happier. Yeah. Right? So it's, it's what is basically saying is the, the way to correct injustice is not to perpetuate another kind of injustice, right? right? So, you know, we used to talk about people see, some people see the world like this, and they say, oh, maybe we should use this, right? This, this is the glass. Yeah, it's not. It's, <laughs> I finished the water. Oh, this is also full. full. Yeah. We need, okay. this is okay. Yeah, I think we'll use this. Okay. Let's hope there is no accident, right? So, some people look at this and say, oh, you know, this is an unfair state of affairs. You know, this is on top. And this is at the bottom. So this is unfair, right? This is unjust. So justice is, we need to do something to get justice. So what is justice? Justice is this, right? Little knowing that now you've created, you know, superior and inferior in the other way. Justice is this, right? It's about equality. So I think that is what this story is trying to bring out, right? That these battles of social justice cannot be won by trying to overturn one and, you know, putting one, you know, making... B higher than A and A higher than B. The battles of social justice can only be won when you have egalitarianism. Yeah, and each of those stories, each of the many, many stories in this text has gems like this. And I really, really believe as a children's writer and somebody who talks to children a lot, that there should be a supplementary text yeah, in the social sciences. It, children should read it instead of civics or instead of or in addition to let them learn civics okay. also but well, in addition books are a big problem now yeah so <laughs> yeah. let's not talk about putting things or taking things out of textbooks yeah <laughs> it's not a it's not a recipe for uh, a comfortable and no, happy but life really i think it would be so entertaining also for the children they, should, they, sh they shouldn't be able to but, they shouldn't be asked to write exams but you're, you're absolutely right yeah. i tell you one of the problems we have is that Civics is such a boring thing. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you get by telling a seventh standard student to memorize that the minimum age to be president yeah. is 35? Yeah. I mean, like, like what, what does it serve? Right? Like, 
I mean, we want to be telling students that look, being a citizen is you know this is what you need yeah. to have voice. You should hold people accountable. Yeah, yeah. Power should be dispersed. Yeah. You know, these are ideas which are interesting. Yeah. Right? You don't even need interesting stories. You know, just these concepts are interesting. Yeah. But we have civics, which you know, the, what is uh, enumerate the fundamental rights. Da 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 da. da. Yeah. You know, who is the president? What's the controller and auditor yeah. general? I mean, how does this matter to anybody, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So we kill citizenship by teaching. Absolute rubbish civics in school, yeah. and people memorize, yeah. and you know, and people are studying for IIDJ anywhere, right? So this is just <laughs> <laughs> that is also true. So yeah, all the languages fall by the wayside. All the yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we have such amazing texts, and we're not using them in uh, teaching. And so I think we've almost run out of time. But before we open it to the to the audience for questions. I want to conclude that story of Prof. So you were sitting with this manuscript for a very long time because you couldn't locate Professor Asfandiar for the longest time. He had done this translation and he wanted to give it back and he didn't know which government it belonged to. So he said, you know, until Professor Asfandiar himself, until I make contact with him, I can't make a decision on it. And but but you said, you know, I should at least translate it and perhaps put it out. Maybe that will get his attention. So he, you did that, and then a few days later, a few days after you had signed the contract, or maybe the book was published or something, he he actually got in touch with you, and he said, "I'm very happy with what you've done, and uh, I'm, I'll be sending my son to pick and, it." And he said that it, I'm, I'm I'm disappointed that it took you so long. Yeah, I'm disappointed it took you so long. I gave it to you ten years ago. But I'll send my son, and he will come bearing this card. And by this time, it begins to sound like the Da Vinci Code. And and what makes it even more surreal and goosebumpy is that the professor is called Asfandiar and his son apparently is called K. Baman, who, if you look up Firdausi Shah Nama, was a king of Persia and his father, Asfandiar, is a great hero in Shah Nama. Okay, so I'm like, clearly these are pseudonyms and they're not, they're not, something's wrong with this whole picture, but you gave it back to this man. You gave it away. So did you not think that maybe you should check his credentials a little more and maybe it's a complete story? Well, well, actually, there was a way to check his credentials. So when Asfandiar, uh, let me just read out that. Yeah. It's very interesting. Because Asfandiar says... Uh, Some really strange... Check it right about Asfandiar. Yeah. You know, Asfandiar and Kei yeah. appear in... Persian, uh, Persian uh, mythology, mythology. Yeah. and uh, they, are, they are two kings, right? So, uh, I received a letter from Professor Asfandiar. In his neat and precise hand, he wrote that he was deeply satisfied with my handling of the matter and that his faith in my good judgment had been vindicated. He did express mild disappointment as a professor would do to his doctoral student, saying that he had expected me to accomplish this task sooner than I had. In any event, his representatives had already commenced his journey to, journey to Bangalore and he would present himself at my office on such and such a date to collect the manuscript. My sense of wonder at how, good, how the good professor had come to know about the upcoming publication transformed into an acute feeling of mystery when I learned how I was to confirm the courier's identity. After scrutinizing his travel documents, I was to ensure that the two longer twigs were twice the length of the three shorter ones, and then, and only then, hand over the manuscript. On the appointed day, a man in a dark, well-cut suit, tailored in the latest fashion, entered my office. He had the demeanor of a South London, lawyer, South London lawyer or an investment banker, his accent polished but neutral. Okay, so all of that. Uh, he proceeded to convey his father's regards and said that he had come, over, come to recover the order's property. Then. The order with the capital O, orders property, then rolling the brass combination locks of his leather briefcase, he carefully took out two items and laid them on the table in front of me. The first was a light blue laser passer issued by the United Nations that confirmed his identity and indicated that he was a special ad advisor to UNESCO. The second was a cylindrical roll, as might contain a scroll or incense sticks, wrapped in a deep maroon satin. The latter, he said, was a gift from his father. And upon presenting it to me, he requested that I open it immediately. Puzzled but curious, I did as he asked. Inside were five twigs of a grassy shrub, brownish yellow in color. The three shorter ones were cut precisely half the length of the other two. There was nothing left to do but to hand over the manuscript that had been in my possession for the past nine years to the properly authorized representative of the person who had left it in my care.
<laughs> it's just it's just very surreal but uh, yeah it happened so wonderful and but, but i can tell you uh, mm. so, so they just to i mean not exactly to spoil the suspense so he was almost through the door when i called yeah. out to him so i said what am i to do with these i asked holding up the twigs i thought he would, i thought you knew he said well there are several ways look in the ninth mandala my favorite do is the 165th in the first he smiled and walked out the door have you managed to decipher that yet yeah okay so tell us i i didn't leave it to okay, them leave it to them okay well, it's actually it's, it, there's something the, the sticks are also of a certain if you read the rigveda you know what, what the sticks are oh okay okay and um, so last question now that your interest in ancient manuscripts has been kindled are there are you may not come across them as dramatically as you did these this one but is there any are you searching are you in the quest for more manuscripts to translate no <laughs> okay. no because i think i think uh, this was already quite an adventure mm. um and uh, i think there are enough stories here for for a long period a long, of time yeah. uh, but w- what is interesting is there are a couple of people who wanted to translate this into kannada and hindi ah. and one guy wrote to me from the united states and he said he wants to convert in, uh, translate it into latin Uh, I said Latin. <laughs> sure, by all means. <laughs> like yeah. two people might read it, but yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so, uh, so that's the, so translations will happen, and I, I'm, I'm really happy to. Uh, one of the things I would want to do is to open source the translations and make it available in Indian languages, but you know, copyright etc. has to yeah. work out. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you very much. That was a lovely conversation. <laughs> Nitina of Takshashila I give you Nitina of Takshashila and please ask your questions We okay, one thing you have forgotten to or not mentioned in your story how did professor aspandiar have your address because he could have not written it to nitina of takshila and the manuscript reached your singapore house that that way i have no idea <laughs> Really, there are so many mysteries in this, which, like you know, Tokharian. The language itself is a mysterious language, right? Very few people know Tokharian. It's you know, it's actually in Xinjiang. Tokharian is a missing language in Xinjiang, uh, in China, which was which was Buddhist. There were there was a lot of Buddhist and Sanskrit heritage there, and that language sort of mysteriously goes into the sand a thousand years ago. So there are lots of mysteries like this, including how the guy found my address, for example. I, I have a question, Nitin. You said that there's no document existing, as far as you know, which documents the relationship between the praja and the uh, the ruler. Yeah, I, if I got it right, right. But if you think about the Magna Carta uh, in England, you know, which was 1215, in a sense, it did put a certain curbs on the ruler and it gave the citizens certain uh, rights. it may not be a perfect example because it was done under duress it was not something that organically evolved and it went through several iterations but would you agree that the magna carta perhaps is one example yeah in 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 uh, in western european tradition yes that's probably the first but if you look at it before before the magna carta right it was largely uh, the roman empire and the catholic church both of which said look you don't have any rights right uh, but if you look at indian uh, philosophy you know i'm always struck by this mahabharat shanti parv right so where bhishma is sleeping on this bed of arrows waiting to die you know whenever there's some some astronomical period when he, you know there's a moment when he wants to die right so so he's sleeping on this bed of arrows right? imagine there like, we have seen the amar sutra kata versions there are like hundreds of arrows on his back and blood is oozing out of it arjuna helpfully shot yeah which he shot you know and this blood is oozing out of it so obviously the old man is in great pain and he's sleeping there and then you know what happens the pandavas go there and they start asking him questions about life philosophy how should a king be how should i be you know i would think like man he's a great grand uncle you know let him be in peace he's in pain you're asking him what should what are my duties as a king what but i mean that's the metaphor right that's again a story uh, trope where the yudhishthira and others ask uh, bhishma questions and bhishma gives advice in that shanti parma which is probably the distilled wisdom 
maybe about 2000 years ago they actually mean he actually says that the king does not have arbitrary powers right the king exists uh, in 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 a way is accountable to the to the to the to the people and the people have a right to throw him out so he basically says if, you know the king can be if if he doesn't uh, satisfy the praja they can actually drive him out like a mad dog you know so the idea that uh, there is accountability to citizens was part of the raj dharma corpus in india right Archidasa has it, but you know it's a little more Machiavellian in the sense that he's telling the king how to keep these people in check. You know, yeah, Magna Carta is probably the first time you see this in in Europe after the Roman Empire, right? Because again, during the Roman and the Greek periods, there were you know democratic traditions, the Senate, yeah. the Senate and others. Hi, Nitin. Uh, so just one one thought, which is that. Uh, the four books which talks about you know i mean uh, citizenship and then economics and so on um, maybe i mean it's out of sync in time but um, do you think the nitopadesha would have something to say about technology nitopadesha Nito hitopade yeah, i mean the book, you think the the old book would have had something to say about uh, technology and how citizens should be i mean how they should behave with the use of technology that's a good one no I, at least I this the fifth book would have the fifth book technology no i think it's there maybe about i think it's more likely to have been about love and sex than technology <laughs> i mean in the order of importance right hi nitin uh, i mean of course the book talks about the fact that some parts of the manuscripts were obscure and you know therefore it couldn't be recovered i'm just i was curious to to learn which are the parts which were reconstructed and which is the one switch but as is see you know i just think we should just accept the <laughs> this whole thing as one manuscript you know it's like where did truth end and lies start you know where did the manuscript end and interpolation start yeah. i mean it's just to uh, it's maybe something which i suppose is of uh, of tradition yeah it's uh, but you know interesting i mean if, if i were to divert this what i found when i was researching for this book is that almost every important text that we have whether it's mahabharat or uh, arthashastra or the puranas everything has a core original version and then things get added on over a period of time sometimes changed in ways that are quite opposite to the original text the yeah, gita is a classic example right so there is there is an original gita and then there is a layer of gita which is added on later in response to social uh, you know movements like buddhism jainism etc right so so over a period of time these texts get you know modified sometimes in ways which are unrecognizable and right the manusmriti for instance has so many contradictory things within it yeah. Yeah, and then there are like open source versions. There are there are forks of the Mahabharata, right? There is a Kannada version, and then there is a Indonesian version and Tamil version. So there are various versions that happen. So I think you should just look at it as this overall, you know, big set of ideas which evolve in various ways. Some of them are interpolated. Some of them are modern editions, like you know, like what the traditional scholars did, right? I'm as guilty as the old older scholars that you just put some modern masala on top of a older tradition right and, and to serve your objectives so almost every person who interpolated an older text had a certain objective right it could have been a political objective or it could be a social objective or something uh, so following on that so could we put a number uh, between 0 to 100 no. <laughs> so, okay. uh, uh, See, this is a problem with you engineers, no? no we <laughs> engineers. Could it be like a hundred percent, and could it just be fiction? I can tell you that it's hundred percent fiction. <laughs> uh, that's. <laughs> yes. So, to make these gems accessible to the masses, do you? see foresee this becoming a, some kind of a video production where you know because this is so much important information that unfortunately in this day and age books are not the right vehicle to reach the masses so do you see anything that can be done 
Well, you're right. I suppose you could, but you know, I'm not very sure whether uh, you can translate the nuances uh, in any written form. I mean, even let's say even the Harry Potter books, right? Very well written books. The Harry Potter movies are also very well made. But people who've read the book first know that a lot of nuance is lost. And some people actually sort of say, hey, the movies are, you know, don't watch the movies, read the book. I think this might be even harder to do uh, because of the, you know, loops and loops within loops. Uh, if you see how it's being done with the Hitopadesha and Panchatantra, for example, the Tinkle and the Amartsitrakata versions are the best, you know, so it's tales from the Panchatantra. So you have 10 stories which are uh, written out as uh, graphic novel format. Maybe th those are the kind of yeah. things you could do. But you know, I'm not a visual and a TV person, so I, I mean, I, I wouldn't, maybe I'm entirely wrong in what I'm saying, right? But I, 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 I don't understand that medium enough. I think your uh, response is fair, but I think something is better than nothing. I, I, I mean, people who are in that uh, realm could, could do that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. How, how about a series of, uh, uh, of uh, cartoons? Yeah. So, so that will be good. Uh, see, this is this whole thing is Rupa Pai is here, yeah. and she, she's no relation to me. Yeah. Now, if I were to send this to Amar Chitrakata and there's Uncle Pai there, they say, "What is this?" You know, she just said Pi squared, then it becomes Pi cube. It looks like some kind of a cons conspiracy of the Pi's, right? Yeah. So, yeah. But I think Amar Chitrakata kind of a format is probably something which is worth doing. Yeah, because you know, I, I find that kids absorb very easily when it comes in the form of and of obviously with all the animal characters and so on, uh, it's almost inevitably going to have to be an animated film and not a, uh, and not a real film. You know, you, uh, unless you really got no. fantastic special effects with talking crows and... Uh, yeah, but, but how can you have all of that? This, this, the fifth book is missing. <laughs> with the fifth book, probably it would have and been... And the question of copyright also. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's that's another missing problem. Oh yeah, absolutely. In fact, no, almost everywhere. If you look at it, there is there is knowledge from uh, from all parts of the world. I mean, all parts. Let's say the West, for example. No, there are a lot of this. For example, you're talking about markets here. You're talking about. Uh, um, you know, uh, Adam Smith and the Unseen Hand talking about free markets, you're talking about capitalism, you're talking about morality, uh, ethical reasoning. You know, one of the conversations I had with Vivek Debroy, he said is that, look, ethics is not a very Indian way of looking at things because ethics implies a very hard sense of right and wrong, whereas in the Indian philosophy doesn't make that kind of a hard distinction. What you should, you're talking about is actually Sadachara, which is good conduct, right? So, but there is ethical reasoning in this. So there is a whole lot of this. But I just want to read out something about this business of, you know, is this knowledge Indian or not, right? Uh, there's a wonderful thing which uh, Nitina of Takshashila says, and he says uh, uh, in the, in, when the kids interrogate him, right? So he's appointed as a teacher of the kids and the kids interrogate him. So he says, uh, you know, are you advocating this or something? So, Nitina replies, what I advocate that to in moderation is anvikshiki, that is critical inquiry. As Kautilya rightly declares, critical inquiry is always in considered the lamp for all knowledge systems, the right strategy for all activities, and the basis of all laws. Therefore, now Nitina says, examine what you've been told by your elders, your teachers, and indeed right now by me, hold them to the lamp of critical inquiry and proceed as reason directs. So I think the way to look at it is don't worry about where the ideas come from. You know, if, if it's a French idea, if it's an American idea, we Indians can adopt it. If it's a good idea, we, it's a good idea, right? So we can adopt it. And as long as you hold it to critical inquiry, if it works for you, we adopt it. Uh, yeah, there's money show. I was intrigued and interested by uh, who was actually the bad guy? So, uh, I mean, is it uh, like uh, the guy who breaks the law is a lesser sinner than uh, the guy who actually wants or is supposed to protect the law? 
probably there is a lot of uh, gray zones in that. I just want your views on, say, if we go back to Mahabharata, say, we always feel Duryodhana is bad and, uh, you know, uh, our, uh, uh, Yudhishthira is the noble one. So he failed to protect Draupadi where uh, uh, Duryodhana, you know, he broke the law there. So how do we, you know, think about breaking the law and the one protecting the law? Who is bad or is it a grey zone or just black and white there? Okay. If you allow me, because the, yeah. the after that story, so there's a discussion between the two dogs, right? They, are, they very much ask the same question, right? Why is it that you decided that the constable was the worst, right? So on the bank of the grey river, the dog Switani said, dear partner, can you here tell right from wrong, which of the three would qualify for the upward path and which for down and which one to be sent back, right? That's, that's what happens. If, you, if you've done well, you go to heaven. If you've done badly, you go down to hell. And then if you need a re-examination supplementary, you're sent back <laughs> to send back to earth. So Sumrata sat silently for some time deep in thought and then he said, Truly, the fox was an abominable character, distasteful in his behavior, stupid in his actions, and inconsiderate in his conduct. Yet, for all his faults, he acted entirely within his rights, albeit with little wisdom. Note that he caused no harm to anyone except to himself. Whether he should be sent up or down cannot be determined merely based on this. The pig was a sly and opportunistic offender. He had no prior intention to steal the pouch and might not have done so had it not been, there, had it not been for chance. Upon reflection, he might regret his action and wish that he had acted otherwise. Then again, upon reflection, he might decide instead to indulge in more theft and stealing. He has indeed committed a wrong, the crime of theft, and has caused harm to the fox. This makes him worse of the two. Whether he should be sent up or down can only be decided based on his future actions. The turtle was a willful offender, for he deliberately refused to perform his lawful duty. His offense is compounded by his personal prejudice, which he allowed to cloud his sense of official duty. He committed wrongs against the fox, against his professional dharma, and against society. He harmed them all. The rabbit was right when he said that the crimes of those entrusted with upholding the law are worse than those of common citizens. It appears to me that of the three, it is the constable that should be sent down. So what, what basically you are saying is that harm is one important thing. Right? Whom have you harmed? Have you harmed no one? Have you harmed someone? Have, have you, have you harmed, a, harmed a lot of people? And have you contravened in your duty? So if you use these two, I think you get a mix of this. You know, one of the things is the purpose of the book is not to give you an answer of right and wrong, but help you to think through how you determine right and wrong. Um, so, you, you practice now. Um, <clears throat> so, context really matters, right, uh, between the past and now, and, you know, lives at that point were nasty, brutish, and short, and you know, the context was completely different. Does, do these old books really apply to the state, uh, to the theory and the practice um, in a different context? I mean, I love reading them, yeah. <laughs> but do they, do you feel, human nature changes over time. We cannot say that we're the same people we were you know, 10,000 or 5,000 or even 1,000 years ago. So as a practitioner of statecraft, it's very broad contours, right? I mean, it doesn't really apply or does it? Yeah. And I would hope it applies. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be a skeptic, but I sometimes feel that, you know, it's sort of like reading a, a horoscope, you know, you'll find something <laughs> that applies to the last year or the last week. Yeah, so I had, a, I had the opportunity to ask this question to Professor Yan Shutong. Yan Shutong is a, Professor of uh, Political Science in China is one of the foremost polit uh, international relations thinkers in China. And I asked him this question. I said, look, there's this Chinese idea of international relations, right? Just like we have the Arthashastra, they have the Atiyanshya philosophy, how international relations are constructed. And, you know, this is a very us versus them. One reason why India and China can't be in peace with each other is because the Chinese system sees the Chinese emperor as the middle kingdom 
and everybody else is just tributary. It does not recognize a sovereign equal, right? So when European ambassadors went to China in the 16th century, they were all put in jail because they came and said, I come to you in the name of the King of France. And they said, if you come in the name of the King of France and claim to be our emperor's equal, you go to jail. If you come and kowtow and say pay tribute, then we are willing to talk to you, so forth, right? So I asked Yan Shutong, does this philosophy still hold, right? And he said, yes. He says, deeply, deeply embedded in our civilizational psyche, the way we look at world, our epistemology, uh, there is this idea which we have received as tradition, which informs the way, the basic way we look at the world, right? So our sense of right and wrong. Uh, in, in the case of the Chinese thing, the idea of a middle kingdom, which is which has no equal. Whereas in the Artha Shastra, he says, you know, there are many kings, you have a Raja Mandala, each of them is a sovereign equal, they're all peers, you can just fight for supremacy, right? But you recognize that guy as an equal, which we do, right? Even in the Indian context, Westphalian international relations works wonderfully for us because we've always been used to a situation where there are many kingdoms, each king is uh, nominally an equal of the other, but more powerful or less powerful. So I would think that this uh, idea holds, maybe not in the exact form, you know, it's not like how Bhishma told Yudhishthira how the king should be, or in the case of, uh, uh, well, let me give you a more interesting one. Kautilya in the Artha Shastra says, one of the rules, jobs of the king is to maintain Varnashrama Dharma, right? If you translate it literally, it means to maintain the caste system. Now, that can't be the job of a modern Indian state, right? The Republic of India's job is not to maintain the caste system. But if you look at what Kautilya was trying to say there, he was saying that you want to maintain social order, right? Social stability. The Varnashrama Shadharma of that era was the way to maintain social stability. But if you look at the role of the state as to maintain social stability, that's what the Indian state does today, right? Most of our energies are spent on maintaining social order and social stability over individual rights and freedoms and so on. So some of that still survives. I wouldn't say I wouldn't say all of it does, but the core of it does. Civilizational state versus constitutional state. Yeah. I think the strong version of the argument that we are a civilizational state uh, does not, you know, the idea, I mean, for those of you who are looking at what this means is like, they're saying, look, uh, uh, Indian civilization is largely Hindu in character, Indic in character. So Hindu civilization, Indian civilization forms a kind of a state. We are not a nation state as it was constructed in the last hundred years, but we have a longer history which has these civilizational roots. So are we a civilizational state? I think there is a lot which recommends itself. We are a civilizational state because our sense of values, our sense of right and wrong, our epistemology comes from Indic and Hindu roots. But we, we, are, we are still part of an international system where there are nation states and the constitution of India creates us as a republic. And that's the operating system that we are working on, right? So we, we can have, maybe we could look at it like, a, like, a, like an iceberg, where deep below we have the civilizational ethos which holds us in place. But on top is the Republic of India which you know, gives us a sense of constitutional behavior. The good news for us is I think these are in sync. Our civilizational, um, mostly our civilizational character does not depart from what is there in the constitution of India. Thank you all very much for coming. And this has been a most uh, interesting discussion and a privilege, Nitin. Thanks, thanks. Thank you all. <laughs>